are now listening to the War Report Podcast Network. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the College Loop Podcast, episode 89 of the College Loop Podcast. The Darvin Adams episode, just because he's been hanging around on Twitter a lot with us, and it's always cool to get a guy who I think is probably one of the more underrated wide receivers out there to kind of kind of hang out with us on Twitter. So that's dope. Uh, we are here uh, talk about some media days in a little bit, but first, Tar, how you doing, buddy? Hey, man, I'm good. Good to be back. Uh, glad to be talking Auburn ball. Glad to be back in the loop. All is well in the world. All star break for the making bacon, and oh my god, am I happy about that? <laughs> a little bit of. Easy tension going on on the making bacon, huh? No, not that's, for real. Going on? Not really. No, it, it, it's it's uh, it's you know, it's it's another day, another dollar, another day in paradise. Today was one of the days of all time. Notice I didn't say the greatest, but um, yeah, no, we're 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 making it through, and uh, I'm trying to sleep as much as I can. To be honest with you, right now, dude, trying to catch up. Yeah, I don't blame you whatsoever. I've all started my job. Uh, if you've missed my Twitter page, uh, I am the TV production teacher at Stand Up Elmore. So you can, if you want to hear me commentate games, if you're not tired of my voice yet, just yet, you might hear me commentate some games for the Mustangs. But it is SC Media Days. Today was day one. And if I'm not mistaken, all I heard about today was Jimbo Fisher, Jimbo Fisher, Jimbo Fisher. I, I think, think what you meant to was. say was, all you heard about it today was Jimbo Fisher, Jimbo Fisher, Jimbo Fisher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the the questions that were being thrown around to Jimbo Fisher was wild. I'm trying to remember who else was there on Monday. Was it? I, I swear it was other people, right? Or was it just Texas A&M? I uh, no, I think Texas A&M just stole the stage. I think I'll look. I'll look right now. But I know you had a a, a little joke to crack, jokey joke about a, an assistant coach for Texas A&M, real quick. Yeah, uh, if, if you one of the questions that was asked by Jimbo Fisher is Bobby Petrino going to be calling the plays, and it looks like Jimbo Fisher has no idea if he trusts Bobby Petrino to call plays or not. I mean, uh, it, it looks it, it's like oh yeah maybe I'll call some plays. He can make suggestions, and that was basically the answer to that question. Like, Bobby Petrino definitely was not hired to just be the play caller, but if he wasn't hired to be the play caller, why did you hire him? Last year was the the issue was play calling on the offensive side of the ball, and you hired a new OC to fix your problems. And what you did was not let if you're not going to let him fix your problems. That's what I'm getting from what Jim Fisher had to say. And there was a lot of bad etiquette for the A and M conference as well. For Jim Fisher was someone asking him about his recruiting tactics. And that might be a little dig at last year's media days where a lot of stuff was going on about another another coach who called out Jimbo Fisher for his recruiting tactics as well. But it was funny. LSU, Missouri, Texas a- and Texas a and all were today. And we didn't hear anything outside of Brian Kelly mentioning the, the quarterback situation, which we're going to get into, <laughs> which he's committed to Jaden Daniels, and he should be. Um other than that, really, no, no huge, huge headlines uh, out of out of out of Monday. Um, Missouri oh. still exists; they're still planning to play football. There was one tip about LSU that with oh, Brian Kelly. Apparently, the, the wherever whatever region he's recruiting in, his dialect changes. Oh yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> like if he's recruiting in in the South, he's like Fi- I am Ali, and <laughs> he goes back to the Midwest whenever he goes up there to recruit. But yeah, that, no, that, but but like that tracks. Yeah, you you should do that. It makes it makes no. Sense. You shouldn't, but that that's very Brian Kelly of him. It very much Brian Kelly of him. Uh, but another thing, Eli Drinkwitz, a guy who I think is the worst coach in the in the SEC. Uh, apparently, he had the best shoe game so far. Good, uh, good. He, I, I think per funny. Ike. Yeah, he needs to be the best of something. But yeah, Auburn has their media day tomorrow, where you'll see Hugh Freeze tied in Luke Dill. Edge rush Elijah McAllister. That was the name I missed last episode when I said Jason Jones. Today and offensive guard out, Cameron. Today's is coming out. Yeah, sorry. And Cameron Stutz is also going to be up on the podiums tomorrow today as this comes out on Tuesday. We might do a reaction episode for what they say. Maybe. Could if, possibly do it. We can, if we can swing it. Yes, I, I would love to. If time persists. Uh, expect there's going to be some, it might be a lot of like a little toasty questions to be asked uh, to, or to you freeze. I don't think there'll be that many. Um, I really don't. I think that we've already seen Hugh Freeze from the the fundamental like premise, right, of Hugh Freeze and the baggage he carries with him. We kind of already saw him 
kind of put out those fires if there were such things when, when he got to Auburn, whatever PR boot camp or not that Auburn chose or did not choose to put him through, I think in large has been successful. And uh, the whole concept, everyone is firmly on the same page now, in my opinion, that Hugh Freeze is the leader of the Auburn football program. And I think a lot of people are kind of starting to turn their heads and pay attention to see what he's doing at, at Auburn because a lot of people think he's going to be successful, or us included. That being said, I mean, there will be some loaded questions because there always are, but I don't think that you'll hear a ton of personal Hugh Freeze questions outside of, you know, how does it feel to be back in the SEC, kind of like those little layups, how much different um, of a culture is, is it at Auburn, you know, what kind of cultural fit are you trying to build, but broad questions from other members outside of the Auburn beat talking about what is, you know, what is your vision for, for, for Auburn, which is obviously to try to win a national championship like every coach, but how do you go about that? I think your loaded questions lie in a couple places, Dylan, and you mentioned them before we went on the air. It's going to be positional stuff and personnel yeah. stuff. Um, where are your, Where's your head at? The quarterback position's got to be top at 1A, right? Uh, I didn't. I don't even think there's a 1B to that, really. I think it's just who who you are rocking with so far is it Peyton Thorne, the transfer Michigan State, or is it Robbie Asher? Are you gonna stick with the guy who you who Auburn uh, put in put in as a starting quarterback throughout the last I think eight games of the season? Was it eight? When was San Jose State? Was that week three? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Last eight weeks of the season, I think is what I'm actually gonna say there. And I mean, you're going into a first season. Uh, you killed the transfer portal. Killed it. And you're just going to be asking questions about that, really. And you kind of hope that the hopeful starting running back doesn't get asked any questions that Auburn has correctly swept under the rug, and rightfully so, because that's that kind of situation you just can't can't let anyone talk about. Don't foster it. Um, exactly. There there will be questions, I'm sure, about Jarquez Hunter and what that running back room looks like. And does do you plan to start Jarquez Hunter this year? The answer should be yes. Uh, outside of that. There should be questions, and I don't know if there will be, but I imagine we'll we'll get a, a handful of questions about Coach Freeze. You know, you've you've really quickly turned around um, this this recruiting pro operation at Auburn. What is your pitch to guys? Which you gatekeep some of that, right? So you can have some pizzazz on the road. But it will be interesting, Dylan, because we'll we'll get it. We'll get a little bit of insight as to hey, what is Hugh Freeze telling these guys to make them buy into what what he's buy what he's selling. And, and there is a large element of that, folks. Um, loyal listeners of the College Loop, hey, how y'all doing? Good to hear. Good to see y'all again. But there, there will be questions. That there should be about, hey, man, like, what are you doing to make them buy what you're selling? Because there is an uptick, and there's a tangible interest around the country now in in playing football for Auburn that we haven't seen since the early days of Gus Malzahn. And uh, it'll it'll be interesting to see if we can get any. Any insight that's that's relevant, if that makes sense, uh, in, in, into what that might look like, because you want to, as a coaching staff, still keep those tricks up your sleeve. Um, and I imagine that there will be plenty, plenty of conversation about the impact of Cadillac Williams. Um, yeah. And there should be. Oh, for sure. I feel like it'd be it, it, it's wrong to even talk about an Auburn coach without mentioning up mentioning Cadillac in any way, shape or form or any Auburn season for that matter. It will be interesting to see how the players react to some kind of questions. Like uh, you freeze back in the SEC. How does it feel to have a guy who was beating Alabama as your head coach? Or uh, I'd beaten him twice and one of the few coaches to ever do that. Yeah. Uh, you have Elijah McAllister, who I think is probably going to get asked a question about Kodrick Fock. Because I think you're going into a – with the top recruit, uh, you got to ask, is the is the top recruit going to be playing very soon? Where do you stand on on where he is? And I mean, Luke Deal, he's in one of the most not talked about best positions on the Auburn football team, the tight end room. Yeah. How does Rivaldo Fairweather fit in? How does this whole tight end room feel? How can you distribute the ball to so many hands? It's questions like that. They're going to make this one of Auburn is one of, I think, the premier. And that's not me saying it's an Auburn fan. I think one of the best teams to look at whenever you're watching their interviews. Because yeah, Mississippi State's going to be cool because it's going to be like going to be watching that because like yeah, you just lost your coach. Rest in peace, Mike Leach, the goat, the pirate. We should do Yard. a college loop. Yar, the guy who's swinging your sword correctly. It, it, that's an emotional side of it, but from a team's perspective, Auburn's going into the season with a coach who got a lot of hate, and 
it's time to put it past that. And those are going to be the kind of questions I think Hugh Freeze got to deal with. How do you push back against people who have been talking on Twitter? Because Hugh Freeze is very active on Twitter. So he sees the stuff, probably more than likely, unless he's smart and has certain words and stuff just blocked. Muted. Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to be funny to see how this interview goes after Kirby Smart does. Because it's it goes – Georgia at 11.30, 10.30 Central, then Auburn at 2, 1, 1 p.m. Central. So it'll be fun. It's, uh, definitely be tuning in to watch because got to hear what they got to say, especially you freeze. Oh, anyway, I almost cracked Cameron Stutz. Uh, talk about the offensive line. Well, Auburn goes from the 15th best off- offensive line in the 14-team league. And hopefully you're looking to actually finish maybe top seven in offensive line and sacks allowed. So. Yeah, that'd be a huge upgrade. Also, something interesting to talk about, and, and I don't know that it's really really gotten the attention of people in terms of, of taking Q Freeze Media Day. We've seen on a smaller scale, say what you will, folks. I'm a you know, I'm a college basketball enthusiast, a huge, huge, huge fan of the game. College football is king. This is the first time in recent memory, maybe ever, that, that Auburn has sent a guy to SEC Media Day that is a controversial figure from the jump. Brian Harson was less of a controversial figure when he got there as much as a, how the hell does this guy fit in the SEC? We now know he didn't. We kind of knew then. But Hugh Freeze is such a different situation. The closest thing I can relate to this happening in, 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 in a high-profile sport at all in Auburn's history is the introduction of Bruce Pearl. And... That even that baggage, I think, still pales in comparison to what what Hugh Freeze carries with him. Now, um, that's not me speculating Hugh Freeze's character at this given moment. I do think that Hugh if, if is a kind of a shining example of learning from when you really screw up. Because if he didn't, then I don't think he would have even given, been, given, been given a chance at Liberty, um, and much less back in the SEC. But it will be fascinating to see how not just. Hugh Freeze and and the guys he's bringing with him, not just the university, how the Auburn fan base responds because there's going to be that reignite of of controversy uh, around the around the league again about oh let's not forget Hugh Freeze is back in the SEC. Let's talk about what he did at Ole Miss. Let's talk about the baggage he brings with him. How does Auburn respond to that? How does Auburn continue to defend this guy when he's not coached a game yet and a lot of people are in his corner? Which is I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's it, refreshing to see from an Auburn perspective. I want to support your coach unless but, they don't deserve it. Yeah, well, unless he's made of but, potatoes. Yeah, if he's from but, Potato Land. <laughs> it'll be fascinating, Dolan, to see how that's that's handled because that is an underlying but high profile storyline that I don't think a lot of people have conversed about yet. There's not a ton of discourse, and there will be tomorrow. Oh, Hugh, yeah. Fre- Hugh Freeze knows better than anyone. He's under a microscope. An absolute microscope. Yeah, and this is back-to-back years where Auburn coaches going to be really under the microscope because you go into the last season of of the potato era, and all that drama hit that you know we had to deal with the student journalists <laughs> with with Harson and I think February, and then radio silence, and then all of a sudden media comes around and Harson isn't talking to anybody. You, the the viral video that went around of him doing a figure eight around two Escalades to get into his car to kind of run away from the journalist trying to ask him questions. And that was the last, that's, that's the last like memory you have of media days from last year was Harson just finding a way to get out of there. And you have, you have a guy in Hugh Freeze who has been very welcoming to the media, maybe not giving them like hats at practice, but has been very open to answering questions and, and has been, you know, not a, not rude at times. Not and, a jerk. I mean, I mean, Brian Harson was a jerk. Yeah, I mean, so he's an asshole. <laughs> I, I, that's that's not even an opinion. That's a fact. Oh, I think no, he would probably I identify as one. I I, ho- I would hope so. Or he's a he's a lying man. Uh, another question you probably ask, you're probably going to see a lot of questions asked about the introduction to Oklahoma and Texas. Sure. And you're going to see some questions about the 2024 uh, getting rid of divisions. Just because you're wondering, how is it going to look if there's just 16 teams all battling out for top two spots? And poor, poor Vanderbilt. <laughs> right. Uh, at least they'll be top. They'll be top one in, in grades and baseball, maybe. Right. Uh, but it's, maybe not baseball. Gonna, 
maybe not baseball. <laughs> You're right. Florida and LSU definitely exist. Uh, but that's going to be interesting to see. And, and, and NIL is definitely going to be up there. They always, they, and ever since the introduction of NIL, they're going to be asking how they think it's going to change, how they can fix it. And the uh, true development over the past, since Hugh Freeze arrived and on to victory. I mean, there's been a direct correlation, folks. There's oh, a yeah. storyline there. Yeah, and it's going to be fun. Tune in today as this comes out. Finally going to get that right. Here's your bonus question, Dylan. Uh, a wild card that I think really probably will be asked. Asking Hugh Freeze specifically about his relationship with Malzahn, Coach Malzahn. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, and they're pretty open about the fact that there's been an open channel of communication, I think, with, uh, between Gus Malzahn and Hugh Freeze, whether that be professional or personal. Well, interpret that as you will, and I'm not. I'm not throwing shade at the Malzans. I think that if there's such thing as a damn near perfect, hu- like example of humans, like from a humility standpoint, it is the Malzahn family. Don't get me oh, yeah. wrong. Um, but his relationship with Coach Malzahn, I imagine that someone's going to talk about that, and 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 how how kind of how many times that their paths intertwined. Uh, there's a there's an interesting line there because Hugh Freeze kind of saw what not to do from a personnel perspective at the end of the Malzahn tenure, and then saw what else not to do. Pretty much everything else, operations wise, on uh, from from the Harson tenure, but it'll be interesting to see if there are some. I don't want to say Malzahnisms, because we're probably not going to get the okay uh, for like like <laughs> like we, like we did from Co- Coach Malzahn. Hope he wins the Big Twelve in his first year with UCF and then the that league. By the way, Central Florida. Sorry, Central Florida. There we go. Um, but very that, that's that's your bonus question, and I, I think it will be asked. Oh, yeah. And, and it definitely, I mean, we saw a pick, it was a couple of weeks ago, where I think it was Hugh, Gus, I think BP. Yep. And was it Butch? Was Butch with them? Or yep. Was it not? Yeah. All, it was Butch. They're all playing golf together. Things that just make sense. <laughs> yeah. You're like, one of the, this, this is just a crazy family reunion. One of these on. things is not like the other. <laughs> but again, yeah, tune into that today as it comes out at one o'clock central, 2 p.m eastern uh, depending on what time zone you were in and maybe expect a video from us uh, going into in depth if if not you'll definitely hear about it for a, a long amount of time on the thursday show just so we have enough time to relish in that moment but we are going to get back into our game by game preview for the 2023 season buckle up auburn fans yeah and as it stands let's see auburn has now beaten umass they have beaten cal they have beaten Sanford, and they have beaten AM. They are four and zero, and then they took their first loss of the season against Georgia. Sure. Going into a bye week, or well, now we are going to be previewing their first or their second true away game. I'm not going to count Cal as an away game because, from the looks of how I've been hearing about it, there's going to be a lot of orange or blue in that, in that stadium. So their second true away game, and probably in the most hostile environment in the SEC, and I would argue probably the most hostile one in all of college football, Beaver Stadium being the 1B or very close to in that situation. Right. But you're going to the Lion's Den, if you will, Tiger Den, if you will. Tiger Den. uh, To play the team that just won the West in the first year of their head coach being at LSU and Brian Kelly, who spent so long trying to make Notre Dame relevant, but they just – faulted every time they got into the public eye uh now he's at a team that can produce talent at a at a yearly rate and first year as the head coach of the lc tigers he took down alabama in an overtime thriller that i don't think me and my dad as auburn fans ever cheered that much for an lsu win uh except for maybe 2019 uh, against alabama uh, but it was a uh, Louisiana Saturday night, very much in the Lark household. It, that night. it was a Louisiana Saturday night in most of the SEC. <laughs> I would say half of Alabama on just the entirety of the SEC. Uh, but Jane Daniels is definitely the player you got to look out for. And I got to be honest, I love this defense. I love the I love the D line. I love the DBs. But this is going to be the game where it's going to be the linebackers are going to have to stand up. And you have Austin Keys who we've said on countless occasions is, is the best linebacker of this core, but that we're running a running a 4-2-5, and we don't know who's that other one playing linebacker next to Austin Keys. It could be Robert Woodyard. could be any – it could be Wesley Steiner, Cam Riley, Eugene Asante, Larry Nixon the third. We don't know. Flip a coin a few times and see what you think. 
It's been Austin Keys and someone else and all of the drills. And if you don't have a stout linebacker quarter for Jaden Daniels, you're not going to have a fun day. You are not going to have a fun day. Well, here's here's someone else to look out for me. Jaden Daniels is is the X factor in that in that LSU offense. And and we talked about it before we went on the air. If Jaden Daniels for whatever reason goes goes down on due to injury, which you don't want to see happen, but LSU's still in good hands in that quarterback room. Let's look at pass catchers for a second here, Dylan. Of the 14 people or individuals that caught a football for LSU last year, 10 of them are returning. Malik Neighbors, thousand yard receiver. Coming back this year, has that connection with Jaden Daniels. Their only significant losses being Jare Jenkins and Keishon Butte. They've got a slew of talent in the running back stable. I mean, they have two four-star freshmen. They're both chopping at the bit to get their opportunity. The defense is questionable in terms of we don't know what that LSU defense is going to look like this year. Just not entirely sure. The offense is going to be high octane. I mean, there's there's no doubt in my mind, that this is going to be a high-octane offense. And there's there's some outside factors about traveling to the Death Valley that we'll get to here in just a minute. But all things considered, Dylan, I mean, I am probably a little dangerously high on the LSU Tigers this year. I do think they're one of the premier teams in college football. I don't think you are in the slightest bit of reacting about that. This is a team that I have looked at. And I'm trying in the process of trying to figure out a way to properly uh, predict all of the, you know, power five, power four, however many there are now. Uh, power four and a half. Power four and a half, depending on how you feel about the Big 12 right now. Uh, but I mean, the Pac 12 is, I, the Pac 12 is underrated a little bit. I think it gets a lot of hate for its joke, joke nickname that's not relevant in the slightest form. But I mean, I think LSU is going to win the West. I, I don't think Alabama has the firepower that we're used to. I don't think they made the I, I don't I don't trust uh I don't I don't really put faith in Kevin Steele to fix a Bama defense that's been having trouble for, for years now. And I look at this LSU team and you brought up Malik Neighbors, who's probably the best wide receiver in the SEC right now. And I think it was last year last year was the sophomore season, so he still has another year to come back if he wants to. He and won't. So, Narrator. He, he, that's not happening. Yeah, he's not. That's fine. Nothing that's against LSU. Happening. It's just that guy's going to be a premier. He's going to be a very, very good receiver in the National Football League. Yeah. And looking at the transfer portal, I mean, LSU went out and got the number one transfer portal class per 24 7 sports. And the then, Brian effect. And you brought up the, the fact that their defense wasn't the greatest last year in terms of pass defense. Like the corners just weren't, weren't producing. But they went out and they got guys. They got uh, A and M five star corner, dudes. Denver Harris. They got Zai Alexander from southeastern Louisiana. They got Deuce Chestnut, a dude that I wanted on Auburn strictly for the name, just because I wanted a Chestnut jersey that bad. And J.K. Johnson, a four star from Ohio State. Like the, the, Brian Kelly looked at the DB room from last year and was like, "This needs help." And then he went out and he got help. He went out and got a four-star linebacker from Oregon State, Omar Spates. And he just he saw what LSU needed to fix in a year that they came in second in the SEC and turned it around, turned it into the best transporter class. And this is an Auburn podcast, so remember that, that we're giving high praise to LSU right now. Uh, and now he's going into this season with probably more hype than Brian Kelly's ever had in – how many years he was at Notre Dame. Sure. And I mean, he, they find a way to fix that defense. Brian Kelly, second year at LSU. I think this is the year he wins the way he's going to win the West two times in a row. And I think well, this team is good enough to beat Georgia. I, I don't know about that yet. I've got to see him play football first, but I will say coming into this Auburn game, they, they played six games before the Auburn game. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I just, I just double checked my out there because it felt like that was too many games, but it's correct. I have them coming into this game six and zero. Uh, now the one toss up and and the and the, and the floor there is five and one. If you if you lose to Florida State uh, yet again to open up the season, I don't think that's happening. Uh, I almost think that Mike Norvell got his adrenaline shot last game uh, last year, and that's not really a slight on Norvell. Actually, all Norvell has done 
since I started really talking down on him has proved me absolutely wrong. I'm happy for him. I really am. I, I cannot say that I support Florida State University Athletics. I really just can never get behind the Knowles. But I, I am happy for Mike Norvell. That being said, Brian Kelly, you can say what you want about him personally, and this feels like kind of the general theme about today's show. Um, if you think that Brian Kelly's a, a, a shit bag, I will probably listen to your argument and agree with you 100%. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to be completely candid. The dude can cut flat out coach ball, and now he's at a program that – Recruits want to play at. I mean, it's not that people don't want to play at Notre Dame. I, I, I'm not not taken away from Notre Dame. I am. But LSU is one of those historic programs in the history of college football. And you saw that how little he had to really fine-tune and adjust in year one. Because let's be, let's be honest here, guys. Ed Orgeron, not that fantastic of a football coach. Just wound up kind of having the stars in line. Love him. Want him to take the Northwestern job more than anything in the world. Not the best football coach. That'd be so funny. <laughs> it, it would be awesome. Um, that being said, you give Brian Kelly some time to work on a down year for what we anticipate to be a, whatever a down year looks like for the university of Alabama. I mean, and it's not, that's never bad, but let's just, let's just be completely honest with ourselves outside of Alabama. Who's really gunning to win the West this year. Let's be completely honest. I'm not saying the West is super down, but they're sure as hell not up. And, and the East is still a cupcake. Don't get me wrong. And, and it's funny to talk about this because in the in grand scheme of things, a middle of the road, like SEC West team is still probably a conference champion in a lot of other conferences. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But all things considered, I think winning the S, the West should be the expectation for LSU this year. Spe- especially if we see that this defense is competent. I think that offense is going to be high, high octane enough that I'm with you, Dylan. If I can have, let's say at this point of the year, if LSU comes in and beats Auburn, uh, obviously that's that's at Death Valley, and there's an element of last time they were in Death Valley, LSU fell to Auburn under Potato Man, and I guarantee you that did not sit well with them. But if if uh, LSU like at this point of the year gets through six or seven games and their defense is competent, I'm going to start fe- feeling really good about calling my bookie and saying I want to take LSU to win the West. I want to take LSU to beat Georgia and take take the money line in the SEC championship. Yeah, I mean I'm looking at the looking at the West top to bottom. <clears throat> There's not a lot of teams that I can feel real confident in. I, I want to say Auburn's going to probably win eight games, and I feel like Auburn has a good chance to finish third in the West. That'd be a great year under, under Hugh Freeze. Oh, one. it'd be a huge year, especially because you're expecting a big year from LSU. Win eight games, win your bowl game, go nine and four in the year, call it a, call it a day, get back to work on the recruiting trail. That should be the goal. Like, I think the Auburn team is definitely going to drop a game that they shouldn't, and that's probably going to be against one of the Mississippi teams. And, and I – it's either them or a and I I don't really see them losing a and because I just we'll heard talk about I, those games when we get there. I, just heard about the, I just heard the head coach of the Aggies kind of say that he just hired a dude just to hire him because he's like, oh, maybe he'll suggest me some plays to run. That's yeah. where I'm coming from with that. But but to keep it LSU centric, it's one and two L- LSU and I think Bama, which sucks to say. I don't, I don't know why this is this bothers you so much, man. Like, just accept the fact that the Alabama is the gold standard for college football. I know Georgia is now, but Nick Saban, Georgia. a Nick Saban program is still the gold standard of college football. So to to get back to Auburn <laughs> for a little bit, uh, what Auburn needs to do to find a way to stay in this game and hopefully win, you need to shut down Jay and Daniels' legs as yep. best as you possibly can. Make them throw the throw, throw the rock. Put a shackle on him, dude. Do not let him run the ball. Make him throw it. And right into the hands of the best position group on this Albert Tiger team, yeah. defensive back room. And offensively, find a way to shut down their pass rush. That's I say their DB room is also really good. The linebackers are really good. Their pass rush with uh, – his name just escaped me. Why did it just get – Harold Perkins. That defense with Harold Perkins. Harold Perkins is a monster of a human being. And I think he's only going into – he was a freshman when he first stepped up onto the scene, and he was, he showed out from day one. Yep. And you have to find a way to shut him down because if Auburn can't run the ball, they're not winning this game. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's that's going to be the that. case for a lot of football games for Auburn this year. And I, if he's a right side edge, he's it's going to be up to Dylan Wade and Gunnar Britton. Whatever side he is on, it's going to be up to those two guys right there to keep Auburn in the game. For sure. And because we talk about how – improve the wide receiver room is and yes it is i auburn's strength in death valley has never been 
passing the ball. Auburn's strength as of late has not, still never been passing the football. You're right. We have not had a guy come within 100 yards of 1,000 yards since 2013. That's 10 years ago. And you go into Death Valley fresh off – no, it's not completely fresh. You're a little a little weak stale of a, of a loss to Georgia. You get a bye week which is probably the best time to have a bye week is right after a loss of Georgia, you turn around, you get two weeks to prepare for LSU and Death Valley. And you're going to need that. You're going to need the speakers blaring in the indoor facility. Yep. Like you got to practice for that loud, loud fan you need base. To be able, like students should be hearing these in the Haley Center, hearing hearing the, the crowd. Exactly. Right. And I'm really actually not even exaggerating. Uh, no, you were completely right. And it's a game where – as we're talking about, Auburn's going to be a one-loss team just who just lost to the number one team in the country. So Auburn's still going to be ranked more than likely, unless yes. the four wins puts them at like 25. Which is Georgia, plausible. Five, Which is plausible. Jumping, very plausible. You go into LSU, and like we said, the most hostile environment in the SEC. A, a place Auburn has won one sat in my entire 23-year life, and that win was awesome. Thank you, Bo Nix, for carrying Auburn to that win. But yeah, don't Auburn, forget that, by the way, people. Yeah. How's that play calling? That was Bo Nix. No, uh, Bo Nix being Bo Nix. Yeah. We look at look at this game, and we just said what we think Auburn can do to stay in it. It's hard for me to believe that Auburn will win this game in the slightest. This feels like the Georgia game. And in a, in a way that – you understand what I'm talking about. I don't think Auburn's right. going to win. I think Auburn's going to keep it that close. And I would love it to happen, but just – the talent of the LSU team, man, it is too freaking good. And it's all about who start. And we don't know who's starting quarterback yet for Auburn. Jaden Daniels has been practicing for the with with the first team offense since they lost since they won their bowl game. So they know who how their offense is going to look. We know how their offense is going to look, but can Auburn stop it? Yeah, and, and there's also this element here, Dylan. And this is me basing off history, which I try not to do a ton. Uh, I, I'm with you. I, I don't know that there's a way that Auburn walks into this to Death Valley and, and gets out of there unscathed um, or without getting banged up and suffering a loss. But here's what I'm going to miss the most about conference realignments. <laughs> Seriously or not. Yeah. Yeah. Re realignment. Auburn LSU is one of the craziest, le le least talked about, but craziest series in terms of football game outcomes. Nobody knows why, other than the fact that I think the LSU fans, wherever they travel with their BAC starts at the legal limit and they go up from there. So even the fans are drunk, um, obviously, but the games are always drunk. Uh, and it, they, they are wildly entertaining. I circle Auburn and LSU regardless of how good or bad either team is every single year. It's it's a game that I look forward to as, a, as an enjoyer of college football. Let's also not forget that whenever LSU teams are really, really good, Auburn really likes to play stinker to them. And... 2019, Auburn almost screwed around and beat LSU in Death Valley and one of the best college football teams quite literally ever. Last year, Auburn was toe-to-toe -to -toe with a team that Brian Kelly was, was leading on a charge that was surging momentum. Their two blemishes being FSU and Tennessee. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, I get it. Tennessee was a wagon last year. But Auburn tried to beat LSU at home. Until Brian Arson did the thing where he decided scoring the second half was overrated. That's neither here nor there. But closer than you think, LSU wins. No, no reason whatsoever, just closer than it should be, even from an LSU perspective or an Auburn perspective for that matter. Yeah, and I guess the key to this game is uh, if, you, uh, if you're only down by like three and a half, uh, maybe if you have like two seconds left. Don't throw a 50 50 ball into the end zone. Don't no, do take that. a knee, <laughs> take a knee or <laughs> kick a field goal, maybe. Uh, one of the two. But Tar, what is your score prediction for the Tiger Bowl in Death Valley? Man, so I'm going to echo what you said for Auburn to keep this one close, contain Jane Daniels' legs, make them beat that DB room, make them burn your DBs. And, and I think you're in decent shape there. LSU puts up three tutties. <laughs> I like 24, 24, let's do 24, 17. Like, like, like within a score, man. I, I actually, I think this one's a little closer, even if LSU winds up going to the college football playoff. 
even if they win the SEC championship, this is one of those games that you look back and you're like, you know, like Auburn had an impressive loss. Yeah. Uh, I, and again, like all the stuff I said, the best part about going to this game is the fact you have a bye week. And LSU saves theirs for Alabama, which rightfully so. I wish Auburn had that sometimes. Uh, but it's hard for me to look at this LSU defense and offense and fully – and best case scenario, Jane Daniels, you lock down his legs, maybe makes a couple mistakes, and Auburn tries to keep it close. I think LSU's still going to win by double digits, but not by a lot of double digits. I think it's going to be like a 20-10 to 10 game if the Auburn defense can step up. Very random side note. I think if Auburn is to beat LSU, it's going to require a defensive touchdown. Yes. I, that's, I know that's a very odd and specific and kind of niche thing to say, but I think it requires a defensive score. I think it's something about Georgia, too. Like if you, You're going to need the defense to put up touchdowns, too, if you want to beat teams on the same caliber as Georgia and LSU. Like You need the defense putting up points alongside the offense, and even that means just like one pick six. I mean, that's or, helping. It's either got to be a defensive score or three turnovers. You generated three generated turnovers, and Auburn cannot lose the football. Yeah, if there's any, and also if there's any swing recruits that are looking at both LSU and Auburn, nothing beats a visit to to Baton Rouge in a night game in the Tiger Bowl, where you watch the team that just asked you to come down uh, lose. Uh, nothing would help uh, Auburn recruiting more than than a win in Death Valley. Uh, but winning's the best recruiting tool, right? <laughs> but as it stands, Auburn is now four and two in our game by game prediction. Still, I think set up for a really good season from from that perspective at least. You you went to College Station, you took down Texas A and M. Whether or not they're good or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, they won, uh, and you go into Ole Miss coming up to Jordan Hare Stadium, and I believe if I'm reading this correctly, Ole Miss has a bye week. But as I've seen in the past. For the Ole Miss fans that Dylan has pissed off and you guys check in on our show every now and again, yeah, y'all might want to not watch next week. Let me just say. I'm, whatever whatever Lane Kiffin's selling, I'm not buying it. <laughs> Let me just say, there was a Lane Kiffin-sized bullet missed by the Auburn Tigers this past offseason. That's the damn truth. And there is nothing that history has told us about the Ole Miss Rebels ever being dominant over the Auburn Tigers. Let that be said. Period. Period. <laughs> and end of conversation. Like. But, Tari, you know what? To end, to end the game preview thing, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know what happens at the end of this month? Are you familiar with what happens? Uh, like July 29th-ish, around that time? Um, let's see here. Do I need the answer for you? Or? I've got I've got, I've got, got dinner plans. Um, you going to be at Auburn around that time? Uh, certainly not. Oh, well, thank God, because you are going to be missing out on a lot of traffic going on for Big Cat Weekend as another big-time recruit for the class of 2027. Class. Did I play along with that pretty well? Yeah, you did. Uh, you. For a second, I didn't even – yeah, I didn't register you were playing along with a bit. Yeah, no, I, I was committing to a bit, and then when you – I saw it click that you understood that it was a bit. Yeah. Um, Big Cat Weekend is going to be awesome. Also, I got tagged in Trent Seaborn's tweet. I was random. Dude. Um, that's, man, I – just saying, I mean, I'm available to be on the recruiting staff. I'm, I'll do what I can. <laughs> I, I think Trent Seaborn, I need to talk about him now, a Thompson quarterback who just – who already has a good uh, like good feeling from the, the entire Auburn fan base, strictly because we just watched Trent Seaborn walk in to the state championship, look at Davis Harson in the face. <laughs> and, and take put a up, shot on his head. And put up like 50 or 60. On, well, on I mean – in my in my humble opinion, um, I think Trent was just warming up for the future at Jordan exactly. Hare Stadium. He he's good under the lights of Jordan Hare Stadium, and it looks like Auburn is his dream school. He wants to come to Auburn more than anything, and I think well, he's just I, going I don't, I don't, I don't know about Trent, that. Right? I don't know about that. Hey, he wants to come to Auburn. I think he, so, he would if Auburn stays tr stays true. I think Trent Seaborn is going to be one of the top quarterbacks of the class twenty twenty seven. Oh, he's going to be the number one quarterback in the class twenty exactly. Um, Trent Seaborn, just to go off on a little tangent here for a second before we get into the rest of the visitors of Big Cat Weekend. I know I knew exactly where you were headed there. Yeah. Um, interesting lineage, personal family friends with the Tongue of Aloha's, which like doesn't help Auburn's case. <laughs> like, oh, you're right. He's a Maryland lock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, his first Power Five offer is the funniest, like 
side plot to me, like ever. It's one of the first guys Luke Fickle offered at Wisconsin. And Wisconsin fans are delusional and think that he's coming to be a Badger. Um, everything about that's funny. I do actually, it's very early in his recruiting process. I know, I understand, folks. I get it. We were talking about a kid who literally can't drive himself. <laughs> he had to like, get his mom to pick him up. His parents, his mom and dad are going to drop him off, presumptively, <laughs> or legal guardian, whatever, are going to drop him off at Big Cat Weekend. I do think that there's a real world where this comes down to Alabama and Auburn. Yeah. And and that is a long game. Like at this point, we will know what to expect out of Hugh Freeze by then. But that is a long game guy that Auburn's on their radar early. He's coming to play football and, and go work out and, and, and go through a camp, the premier camp for Auburn athletic, Auburn football with the big boys, the guys that are actively being recruited. And, and that says something about him. Trent Seaborn, one of the most interesting visitors at Big Cat Weekend this weekend. But it's never too early to get it planted in their ear. So if I yeah. see, I'm telling you, if I see some like, like if I when I go to my little cousins that track meets this, this upcoming uh, this upcoming year, if I see some like 14, 15 year old kids running like four fours, I'm gonna go just go tell, give them Coach Freeze's number, <laughs> and, and we're gonna we're gonna start the process now. Yeah. And might I add, this is no baby Gronk situation. We have seen Trent Seaborn play high school football at the highest level of Alabama state football against one of the premier teams of the high, of Alabama and show out as an eighth grader. Oh, I he also like he he's built to be a a, a professional quarterback. Like the, this, the, what'd you say? He's so cold. Oh well, he's cold, but also like and even in eighth grade, like he's standing, I think, at five ten right now, he's gonna be fine height wise. Um the kid is has the right build and has a super high football IQ. There is, I show me an eighth grader that's ever had that much football IQ, ever. What the he's hell? Cold. He's cold, but is he cold enough to freeze? Bro oh, might God. win five state championships. Dude, that's a stat. No, That'd be awesome. He plays for Thompson. It's not unreasonable. It's not at all. But just like, <laughs> when have we ever seen a, a starting quarterback win five state championships? Trent Seaborn, and then you'll see him win four natties at Auburn. It's going to be crazy. Four Heisman, four Maxwell Awards, four Davey O'Briens. First exactly. overall pick. He's going to he's going to be a first overall pick in both MLB and NFL drafts. <laughs> he's going to win 17 Super Bowls and The seven. NHL has also drafted him number 1 overall just in case. He's going to he's going to lead the Auburn hockey team to national championship over Michigan. Like he's going to that's how cold he is. <laughs> yeah, I I can't if you guys think we're just like being like disproportionately weird about this kid, you've clearly not watched his film. I mean, it is unbelievable. Dude can't even see over all of his offensive linemen yet. <laughs> Which, that, I mean, we've seen in the past. There are some really good short kings out there at quarterback. Listen, I'm a short king and I'm, I'm an advocate, but bro is going to wind up being 6'2", six, 6'3", six two, six two, six and he's already a gunslinger. Um, Hugh, you need to spend some time with him this weekend. Like and and walk him through some QB drills. Like yeah, you need to keep an eye eye on him and make sure no one else. Because I mean, there's not another team closer to him than Hugh Freeze is right now. Well, oh, you mean geographically? It's like actually, I think yeah. geographically Tuscaloosa is closer. That's neither here nor there. Who else is going to be a Big Cat Weekend? Dylan, let's walk through the list of guys you have circled. I know that you're a recruiting junkie, um, such as my like much like myself. Who are you most excited for to see? on the planes this weekend, what commitments are you looking for? Well, I'm looking at the, I think the biggest name that's going to be there is KJ Bolton. Yeah. But I'm just going to run through the numbers real quick. Auburn is going to have six, five stars, 16, four stars and seven, three stars show up the big cat weekend and six, five stars. I got all guys who I think Auburn is going to have a pretty good chance at getting one of those guys. Uh, Perry Thompson is going to be there who is choosing to go to Auburn over Alabama that weekend. Where it, it's also Bama's big recruiting weekend too, might I add. Which every year that Auburn does this, I know uh, the, the, this was done under the previous administration, but every time that Auburn schedules their A-Day, it's not the A-Day, excuse me, their Big Cat weekend on the same day as as Alabama's Big Cat weekend, we saw them do it with A-Days as well this year. The only thing that comes to my mind is just huge nuts. <laughs> huge nuts. That's all. I mean, Auburn Auburn's A-Day game was already – uh, more intriguing to watch when I had uh, Alabama. There was not, I don't think there was an Alabama quarterback that didn't throw an interception at, at their A-Day. But, yeah, you're looking at Demarcus Riddick, 
who is going to the Cat Weekend three days, might I add, after he announces his commitment, which, as this comes out, in eight days, he'll be announcing, and then he'll go to Big Cat Weekend, depending on where he commits, I guess. He, he might back out if he doesn't commit to Auburn. No you don't shot. Think so? You don't think so? Oh, so he's going to keep his recruitment recruiting open. Recruiting is always open until you sign on the dotted line. I don't care what anybody says. You're right. You're right. You Unless said, you're a guy like a certain quarterback coming to Auburn next year that's just genuinely done with all of this, it's always open. Well, he's uh, Walker White is unapologetically on staff at Auburn as we speak. He's whoa, on whoa, whoa. For legal reasons, NCAA, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> he is unofficially – not on he's, he's an honorary not on member staff. of the honorary honorary there we go honorary member of the recruiting staff there we go that's what i meant to say that was the joke once again day. let me reiterate honorary <laughs> but, a guy who is going to be he is going to be right next to perry thompson demarcus reddick and uh kj bolden that entire weekend the college legislation instead of the college loop <laughs> and i I, I I think of those three, Perry Thompson is the most likely to flip. Uh, Demarcus Riddick, it's, it's kind of hard. It's going to be real hard to flip a linebacker that would be from Georgia. To it's going to be real hard to flip a guy from Georgia, and I don't think it's, I don't really think it's going to happen. It'd be cool. I would I would do a back I'll do a back, back flip on the show. Oh, uh, I hope you flip if they flip him. Uh, it might not be a good back flip. It might be on the floor, but it'll, can we do like a video of? Can we make a like a TikTok? on the college loop page of one of us on like a trampoline doing a really, really bad backflip and whatever our recruit flips, we post it. You can do that. Uh, I'll do I it. it. I will face plant too. Like uh, not on purpose. I will be trying to land this. <laughs> but yeah, huge recruiting weekend yet again for the Auburn Tigers and a, and a weekend. Where I think we're going to see some commits. And might I add, KJ Bolden is going to commit, I think a week after this happens. So, and I think it's going to be the last real visit he has before August 5th, or you might see two Auburn commits that day if KJ Bolden gets real, real uh, persuaded. I think you can guarantee, not guarantee, that's a strong word. I think look out for two commitments. I don't know which two on Big Cat Big Cat Weekend. I think at the end of that day, Saturday, we will have a couple guys in that class of 24 that we know about. Yeah. A couple, and, couple more. And as it stands, just going to the class of 2024, Auburn currently stands at the 37th overall recruiting class with 11 commits so you're still looking for the volume that's going to skyrocket once if you get two or three commits and might i add auburn has nine four stars to two three stars so already panning out to be a really really good looking class for Hugh Freeze's first full year as auburn's head football coach but we ain't done yet and big cat weekend is the weekend for Auburn to get some commits in a, in a month that's going to be awesome. I almost did the Barney Simpson legendary thing, but I decided to just go with awesome. Legend. Wait for it. Wait for it. Dairy. I'm surprised you didn't do it. <laughs> I hope you're not lactose intolerant because the last one is dairy. <laughs> but uh, tune into the next episode of the College Loop where, uh, oh, Lord, I got I to gotta find out who said it to us. Let's see. I got to get his name. Theoretical Thursday. Theoretical Thursday. Thank you, Ant Robinson, 5412. The great question, by the way. For his Theoretical Thursday thing, it is, what if Hugh Freeze was hired in 2021? What if they hired Hugh Freeze right after firing Gus Malzahn? So, I'll tell you this. Th Our last game as seniors was sure as hell not the Birmingham Bowl, and you sure as hell don't lose to Houston. <laughs> mm. mm. Oh, mm. uh, yeah. But yeah, tune into the Thursday episode where we're going to cover that and tune into tomorrow where we're going to probably hopefully do some, uh, or today as it comes out. There we go. Cause it's Don't struggle with today. Yeah, yeah. I, I took like a 30 minute nap and that was probably the worst thing I could have done before recording. No, it's so, okay. I took an hour and a half nap and Abby called me at 7 30 and I thought it was 7 30 tomorrow. <laughs> so, anyway. But yeah, Tar, let's swing it on down to the hardwood. That's right, Dylan. It's time to talk. College basketball, Auburn Tigers hoop, it's right here on the College Loop podcast, where we've got some interesting news on the hardwood. We're going to band together, right? And we're going to just go ahead and pronounce this name the way we're going to pronounce it. If you have the correct pronunciation, I was unable to find it. If you have it spelled phonetically, 
first off, if you're on the YouTube, drop make sure you drop a like, subscribe, and ring the bell. But and drop it in, in the comments. Well. <laughs> What's that? Drop the pronunciation guy yeah. as well. Phonetic, phonetic pronunciation, certainly uh, appreciated. But Flory Badunga is what we're going to go with here. Let's go with just Flory because I don't want to. Yeah, I, I have more faith in Flory than I do the. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, look, I awesome name already. I I already love it. Um, he already fits it. He, you are an Auburn Tiger, um, in, in, my, in my opinion. Five star center out of Kokomo High School in Co Kokomo, Indiana. Excuse me, I am struggling this afternoon, this evening. 99 overall composite, 9989 on 247. Dropped his top four today as we're, as we're filming this show, yesterday as the show's coming out. Final four, all blue blood programs. Duke, Kansas, Michigan, and Auburn. As I said, all blue blood programs. The BP effect is unbelievable, guys. It's just unreal. <laughs> Dylan, how big of a pickup would this be? Because we presume, even though he'll have another year of eligibility, this is the last year of Jani Brown. And and you really, and we know it's the last year of Dylan Cardwell. And so now you're looking and going, wow, Auburn could get a real center, someone that plays this position. And not have to use a stretch four all the time. How big time would this be to add to Bruce Pearl's next chapter of, of this of this program? Which, by the way, folks, we were not talking enough about. Recruiting under Bruce Pearl the past half decade has been remarkable. Continue, Dylan. Uh, you were not wrong in that statement. Uh, it, it'd be it'd be as huge as Flory is uh, six foot eight, two fifteen. I don't understand. You said ninety nine is his rating, but he's number four overall in the. I, the high school basketball rec like recruiting things are so weird to me because every no, I, was saying, like I was talking about stars, uh, stars. But he's yeah, ninety nine. He's a, he's a ninety nine, ninety nine, eight nine composite, which that is quite literally the definition of damn near perfect. Uh, yeah, uh, and you're going to this. Uh, he's twenty twenty four, correct? Before I start spewing nonsense. No, yep, number one center in the class twenty twenty four, number four overall player in the class twenty twenty four. In a class you're already expecting to get one one and done player into Hod Pettiford. You turn yep. around and you hopefully can sway Flory from three other blue bloods uh as well. Uh, I don't know how likely it is Auburn's gonna get him, but if you do you have a guy who you can establish at the center for a year uh because it's kids good. Uh, shot blocking dude, play defense, lights out defender. Uh, something Auburn has been been very accustomed to to having nowadays. After the Walker Kessler and and uh, Janai Broom era is over with, uh, but it'd be awesome. It's spelled yeah. A U S O M. A U S O M. Uh, <laughs> I think it's we're not like I don't know how we've lost sight about this. We've been saying this for a while, folks. Class twenty twenty four is probably going to wind up being the best class in the history of Auburn basketball. Like, I, like recruiting alone, fr incoming freshmen alone, before we even talk about the transfer portal. Bruce Pearl, you are a damn wizard. Because we've seen guys back off their commitment. Uh, we, we've seen a couple of guys back off their commitments. And Bruce Pearl not blink and, like, kind of go get better replacements in that class. Um, we, we knew there was going to be some, some shake up there when, when you lose West Flanagan, mutual parting ways goes to Oxford. Good luck with that. Have fun with that mess. But holistically, I mean, BP just doesn't bat an eye. And I know it sounds like I'm just absolutely meat riding the dude, but he's unbelievably good and, 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 and from a recruiting standpoint, folks, Auburn university being this relevant. In the recruiting game for college basketball, not football, basketball, for this extensive period of time, and looking at what this 2024 class could look like, that is freaking bonkers. Bonkers. It's crazy, and I and right now I think the only commit Auburn really has right now is Todd Pettiford. But and this he class alone has the like number 16 class in the country, by the way. Yeah, and, and that also can come from the fact that you really don't need to recruit all that all that many players unless you're completely right, rebuilding no, correct. the program. One of these not the end of the deal and, and deal breaker there. But yeah, wow, it, it's it's wild what BP has given to the. I, I'm going to ask you this before we get uh, before we get to the next topic: best recruiter on the plains right now. Mm. Butch Thompson. Bush Thompson. All right. 
Well, we'll get into that in a second. But I, I, I mean that nothing against Bruce Pearl or Hugh Freeze. Look at the amount of guys that Butch has never gotten on a campus because they've gone in the first and second round of the MLB draft. If those dudes weren't going to the, going to the league, they wanted to play college ball right here at Auburn. That is impressive. Continue. Very, very impressive. And, I mean, yeah, looking at Flory, if he were to come to Auburn, I'm just imagining Lob City to High Pettiford, throwing it up to Flory, however you say his last name. Pettiford to Badunga just sounds <laughs> awesome. I'm imagining Auburn plays like a, a Pac-12 team in 2024. Get uh, Bill Walton to call it. I need a, I need Bill Walton to call a game with Tom but, Pettiford. But the best thing about him calling games where it's like a Lob City situation is he just screams. He just yells. <laughs> oh, oh, why, oh, my God. That dunks basketball. Auburn. I love basketball. Like, I'll never truly understand how his brain works sometimes. Well, if it does. It does. Uh, the 60s were a hell of an experience for Bill Walton. <laughs> And, um, yeah, that's all I got on that. But, yeah, uh, just to move on from college basketball to NBA basketball, Jabari Smith named on the NBA 2K Summer League second team after only premiering in two games. That is literally why he's on the second team, because he only played in two games. (laughs) If he played in three, first team. First team. Uh, Jabari is a different basketball player right now. I we talked about it in in depth after his back to back just not so outings and let's not forget the dagger the awesome game winner most electric game winner I've seen in summer league probably ever and I'm an expert in that I'm not really but it was awesome um yeah Jabari Smith Jr is a sneaky pick for if if not an NBA All-Star this year because of sample size right whatever whatever it looks like certainly going to be acknowledged as one of the most improved players year to year. I, I really, really, truly believe that. And that's not that he didn't have a high ceiling or a high benchmark, rather. It's just, I really, really think that if Jabari can build off of what he did at the end of last year, and then it, it's apparent he's stronger, he's quicker, he's he has more endurance this year, he's, he's shooting the lights out, even more so than he was before, he's shooting the ball with confidence. Jabari Smith Jr. can really take the NBA by storm this year and say, hey, by the way, guys, Paolo's not that damn good. Yes, actually, he is that good. But I had every much his right to be a lottery pick as this, as this guy did. Uh, I mean, poor Dylan sitting over here banging his head against the wall because of Chet. But you, you you see where I'm going. That dude is going to be super fun to watch this year. And that's not just from an Auburn perspective. Jabari Smith Jr., I think, will legitimately – people will know who he is by the end of this year. Oh. If you don't already. Sure. Uh, he has a – I've already called him a lock for the uh... – NBA All Star game. So, <laughs> I th- I don't want to say 2024 NBA All Star game. I will go 2025. I mean, it's a fair shot either way. I I, I think it's going to go. I think the next like, how long will Jabari Smith play in the NBA Force? Like 20, 2030 maybe 2035. Probably, so from 2024 to 20 to 2040, expect Jabari Smith to be on the All Star list. I do think that Jabari Smith, um, by the end of his rookie contract, will be in in in, in have grounds. To negotiate a damn near super max. No, not super max, but max deal at, at his age. I, I really think he's going sure. to be that valuable of a player. And I mean, what if Jabari Smith would have stayed another year? He could have been the number one. <laughs> Come back to another theoretical Thursday where we talk about what if Jabari Smith decided if, to not be a lottery pick. College Loop NBA edition. What if Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler both walk after their rookie deals and sign with the Atlanta Hawks? <laughs> Good God. I would be insufferable, folks. Just so y'all know, I would be insufferable. He already is for what the Atlanta Hawks are already not. He already is the. I sent him Barney James getting drafted by the Atlanta Hawks, and I thought he was gonna have an aneurysm, Me? a happy aneurysm. But uh, yeah, you went a little crazy. Yeah, hell yeah, I want Braun. <laughs> I don't want stupid. you. Stupid. <laughs> I'll treat you, Chet Holmgren, for that pick. <laughs> He has a chance to get rookie, rookie of the year, might I add. He can win rookie of the year. All right, Ben Simmons. I, 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 the comparisons are there. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Guy who I, but, Tar, what are the odds? It's early on, 
And, you know, we're all about overreacting here on the show and the fan base as a whole sometimes. What are the odds Jabari Smith becomes the, the best Rockets player ever named Jabari Smith Jr.? What are the odds of that happening? Hi. <laughs> there we no. go. What are the odds that Jabari Smith goes Jr. goes down as the greatest hit player in the history of basketball? I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, dude, I, I think he's already there. We saw what he did I, the first two games of the Summer League. I think he's already there. I think he's top I, of the league right now. Stop count. Stop the count. Stop the count. That's going to get quoted, and as no one's going to understand, that's a might be a little bit of a joke. <laughs> until uh, it's until it's proven true, then it's no know. longer a joke. <laughs> what the hell you're joking about? Jamari Smith Jr. is awesome. But let's talk Auburn baseball real quick. Got a little summer league no, news on. It's very fitting that I get to kind of bring into this and bring Move from one summer league to the other. I do. I well that, and I work in summer ball. Um, exactly. So. Super, uh, super interesting uh, piece for me to be able to talk about here. Ike Irish named a Summer League All-Star for the Cape Cod League. For those of you guys who are not familiar with Summer League ball, most of us aren't. I was not until a few years ago. Cape Cod League being the premier league in, in collegiate summer ball, and they are, I mean, you get to live in Cape Cod. It's not a bad deal. And uh, the premier developmental league. So uh, excellent news for Ike Irish. Ryan Olsen, also a Summer League All-Star for the Great Lakes League, which is probably the second or third best, depending on who you ask. Um, it's a very, very solid and very competitive league um, to compete in. So that means they're actually going up against guys that they're going to be playing of that caliber. Um, it's it's good reps and, and good, good ways to keep the arm strong and build up arm strength. Derek Fabian, out of the University of Florida, is transferring to the Plains. He's going to be joining the Tigers. After a season last year, doing that, he he just slips right into this lineup quite nicely. I'll be honest with you. I'm just I'm just, I'm just going to be real. Batted 290, two home runs, ten RBIs, slugged 447, and had a fielding percentage of a thousand, which means he's not an everyday guy. Only ten, ten ribbies and two homers, but the sample size was solid enough for me to feel pretty good about this addition. Um, Dylan, you're snagging a guy from Florida. If nothing else, you know he's getting development because Florida is really freaking good. At college baseball, so your your initial reactions here, as well as uh, the, the every all the other news with summer ball. Yeah, uh, you you get a guy after you went to the MLB draft and you kind of <laughs> lost a lot from uh, that from the <laughs> from second base to third base. Auburn lost, I think, four players in the draft, and yeah, pick up. Uh, you've already picked up a couple guys to kind of help replace that. Uh, I don't know if Sam Mongelli has announced if he's gotten signed yet. I need to look into I'm that not, a little not, bit. I've not read anything on that regard. Like I've not heard anything on that new, on that front. Because if anything, he's Auburn's third baseman, and Derek Fabian could be Auburn's shortstop for however many. Guys. I from what I've been hearing, I think he got he entered the portal because of PT, which playing time for all you uh, non acronymists out there. Uh, uh. And you look at, he said last year, about a 290 and two home runs, 10 ribbies, and second percentage of 0.447. Uh, that is in, I believe, I counted right, 22 games. So he did not play a lot. And field percentage of 1,000, I think that was a, I think he had 13 games where he was on the field. So PT, maybe. Sure. Uh, it could be the reason why. Uh, but if you go to Florida, if Florida's recruiting you for any reason, We'll take a chance. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it. We'll figure yeah. you out. Cause we, I, we can I, make something work. <laughs> if you weren't paying attention to college baseball this past season, uh, Florida finished second <laughs> behind an LSU team that was really good. <laughs> and you know, Florida losing the college world series, man, it couldn't happen to a nicer group of folks. It really, <laughs> really could. I, I'll be honest with you. I want, I want LSU to win that college world series. LSU baseball fans. I understand the rowdy factor. They're fun folks. They're really fun. <laughs> they are so fun. <laughs> Florida fans on the other hand, insufferable. <laughs> Florida baseball fans it, Florida is to baseball fandom as Arkansas is to basketball fandom that's where I'll leave our conversation on, on. Could, have to, could have went to football that's a quote graphic right there oh and Georgia is to football fans is that we want me to round that out <laughs> either that or the other one across the state either mm -hmm. one it's still Georgia for me, big dog. They win my they win my most obnoxious fan base ever. The University of Georgia has the most obnoxious fans in the history of college football. Period. There you go. Throw that up. I don't care. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll tag every Georgia fan fan page I can think of. Yeah, please do. That's fine. <laughs> um, that's absolutely fine. Dylan, 
It's been a, been a blast to be back on the show. Glad, glad, to, glad to be back on our, on our project together and uh, appreciate you uh, working with me. For those of you who are hanging out with us here on the College Loop, we are over 420 subscribers on YouTube, which is another funny number. So that's super, super cool. If you're hanging out with us right now and you're watching this episode and you've not liked, subscribed, and ring the bell, what are we doing? Respectfully. Respectfully. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, ring the bell, and follow us along on all of our other socials. Dylan will plug those here in just a moment. Obviously, we have our Theoretical Thursday already coming up for this week, but we want to hear from you guys. Give us your thoughts, your takeaways. We are literally here for your takes. We will throw them up on, on, this, on the show. We love talking with you guys and, and get, hearing your perspective on things because sometimes we always think that we're right. I always am. Dylan, not always. But uh, we, all, we always uh, kind of see things in our own little mind. Dylan and I kind of complete each other's sentences, and, and Daniel and Colin have that aspect too. So we want to hear from you guys what, where your thoughts are at, whether that be football, basketball, baseball, golf, competitive basket weaving i don't i don't really care give, give us your takes because i mean who's it gonna hurt who, who doesn't love sharing their opinion and telling us we're wrong tell us we're wrong all the time like subscribe <laughs> ring, ring the bell thank you guys so much for listening to the college Lit podcast i'm harrison tar at by harrison tar on the bird app if you want to come hang out with us hang out with me over there i'd greatly greatly appreciate it shout out trent seaborn for unintentionally tagging me and i made a bunch of new friends uh from that thread so uh super super excited to have you guys here dylan let's go home yeah, and I'm Don Lark at you the tank on Twitter. If you're watching, it's just right there. Um, I missed a point. There he is. Right there you there. go. At Y A B O I the Tank. It's also in the link below if you're watching on the YouTube. And while you're down there, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, leave us questions, leave us uh, your replies, leave us your opinions. Uh, tell us uh, what your favorite color is. You know, any of those things. We best barbecue really sauce. Know. Best barbecue sauce. Best, best kind of barbecue, like geographical, like mine's Carolina. If you made it this far, there you go. Uh, but yeah, if you want to follow us literally anywhere, you have us. Uh, you have us on Twitter, where we just hit 400 followers on Twitter. Uh, That's a huge W. Shout out to the Loop Peoples. As as we're recording this, it is now an error page because we are now 404 on Twitter. Uh, you have us on here, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you want to listen to us, of course, you have us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and pretty much everywhere. You get your podcast. I will say one place. Don't look for us on MySpace until we hit a thousand subscribers. Then you can start searching this up on MySpace. It's going to happen though soon, Dylan, because our fans freaking rock. I love our listeners so much. You guys are dogs, absolute dogs. <laughs> but, and again, I think any more subscribers. And before Colin gets to end his internship, we're going to make him dance. Oh, yeah, drop that in the comments too. Should we put him on full time? Yeah. Do you like Colin? Do you guys Please like let Colin? Let us know in the comments. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> if you made it this far, tweet at us too. Tweet at him. At Byers North Colin. <laughs> at Byers North Colin. Spelled B-E-Y-E-R-S-D-O-R-F. <laughs> Colin. Colin with one L. That's Just right. have that on the show. And Daniel Locke, of course. Follow him as well. At Daniel J. Locke. And all of but, our friends are with the War Report. Holy crap. We almost forgot. And the War Report. <laughs> All right. Uh, B. Will. Caesar. The Uptempo Pod. Mike G. Uptempo. Dustin and Blake. Follow all those guys. We are on a roll here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> We're having a blast here at the TWR Network. And uh, potential some cool things uh, you might be seeing soon for the loop uh boom welcome to the loop for my have another interview coming up and some other cool little things going on around the college drip, loop drip splash <laughs> but all being said this has been the college loop podcast <laughs>